So, by the late 1990s, I'd managed to spend my entire life as a New Yorker, a Manhattanite even, without ever having once been to the 21 Club. Then, in an odd five-week period, I found myself there twice. The 21 Club is a storied New York restaurant. It's in a townhouse on 52nd Street. It's notable for several dozen iron lawn jockeys that decorate its front steps. It started out as a speakeasy during Prohibition. At one time, it held the personal wine collections of Frank Sinatra and other stars. In the 1950s, if the Rat Pack was in town, that was where you'd find them. So at any rate, that's where I was. The first time in a private function room upstairs, and then a few weeks later in the main dining room on the ground floor. In the center of the room was a large table holding about a dozen BWMs, beefy white males. Not to be confused with the BMWs I'm sure some of them drove. These guys had all played sports in college and in the 15 or 20 years since then had sat behind desks figuring out ways to steal food from the mouths of workers' children or something like that. They were celebrating. They had just had an initial public offering where their company had just been sold. Whatever it was, they were now billionaires. On paper, at least. Hopefully, they lost everything when the dot-com silliness went bust just a, few, just a short while later, but hope, as Emily Dickinson so famously declared, is the thing with feathers. They were large, they were loud, they were rich, and I loathed them intensely. They kept going, whoa, and giving each other high fives. They were ordering $500 bottles of wine, four at a time, two for each end of the table, and two for the center. Their wine bill alone was going to be at least six grand. On one or two occasions, the maitre d' asked them, smiling and with love, to take it down a notch, but he didn't want to take his foot off the gas pedal of how much they were spending. At a certain point in the evening, I got up to go to the restroom, which you enter through the wash-up area, make a left, and that's where the stalls and urinals are. Just as I'm finishing up my business and zipping up, two guys from that table walk in. And as I'm washing up, I'm having to listen to their stupid talk about market share, exploitation, and investor value. When I finished washing, this ancient, white-haired, black man with slightly tremulous hands gave me a towel. I mean, this guy was the ancient washroom attendant when the Rat Pack called 21 Club home. And by towel, I don't mean some flimsy paper affair. I should have such towels at home. Thick, luxurious terry cloth. I don't know thread count from Thunderdome, but if it applies to towels, this one had it. I wanted to wrap myself up in it and go to sleep in the hamper. But I tossed a dollar into the man's dish and was just about to leave when inspiration struck. I said to the old man, hey Frank, sucks you've got to work on your birthday, but the other guy called in sick, huh? Now he's non-committal, mm -hmm. he doesn't know where I'm going with this, or maybe he just learned long ago not to contradict white men. But I plow on, well I don't know how you do it, but you'll look younger every year. Happy birthday. At which point one of the guys from that table says, wow, it's your birthday? Happy birthday, man, and proceeds to throw a 10 spot into the guy's dish. And his buddy says, what are you doing? It's the guy's birthday, and he throws a 20 into the plate. As I leave the restroom, I look over my shoulder, and the old man gives me the warmest, most humane wink that will remain emblazoned in my heart for as long as I am spared. As these two guys are returning to their table, three of their fellow beasts are getting up to go to the head, and they are told to take care of the black guy. It's his birthday. Roger that. 10-4, good buddy. <laughs> the moral of this story, dear comrades, is that the revolution is to be fought on whatever front we find ourselves. Thank you. <laughs>